Caitlin Yang graduated from USC, and then you started your own company, Alpha Pictures. Was it 2013? Okay. All right. So yeah. So tell us a little bit about Alpha School. Yeah. So I came out here to do post production. I like uh, many people who get into this field. I fell in love with special effects and visual effects when I first saw Star Wars many years ago. And that was just kind of my, my track for life ever since. I came out here to Columbus to USC Film. I study animation. And I freelanced as a visual effects artist for what it felt like all the companies here in LA before I kind of took the leap of faith and started Alpha Studios, my own post production company, in 2015. And we continue to offer services in visual effects, color grading, and name and uh, My name is Tariq Mohamed. I'm the director of Abu Chang. So, um, can you guys hear me okay? Yeah. yeah. Um, so, uh, the department that I run at Sundance is kind of a new department. We've only been around for a year, and I think, you know, to the Institute's credit, um, I do this gesture a lot when I talk about the shape of the organization because we're sort of classic like flat work structure where we have all these different kind of artist programs and the festival and everyone has historically throughout the life of the organization going all the way back to the creation of the film festival, the creation of the Institute and the relationship that our founder Bob Redford had with the Native and Indigenous communities in Utah when he was sort of working with them to build the community there. We've always sort of had these values of inclusion throughout the organization, but um, it manifests in different ways for different programs. And I think increasingly as artists within the industry are converging, um, the work that they're doing is for transcending from one medium to another, from one discipline to another, um, and also recognizing just kind of the, the selectivity of the way that our labs work. One of the things that we really recognize is that there needed to be kind of a company-wide efforts to really work in particular with emerging artists, um, with an emphasis on cultivating and developing talent from underrepresented communities, and across a lot of the communities, and not defining that in a really sort of specific, prescriptive way, um, and really sort of like realizing and living those values in terms of what we do within the labs, like creating programs that are designed to develop talent from emerging artists. Um, we work, so we sort of talk a little bit internally, we talk a lot internally about this thing, of course, about sort of the artist pathway, which are the different stages of an artist's career. And as we kind of define our values and what we're trying to do around inclusion, there are a couple of kind of key areas where artists in particular from underrepresented communities are having a difficult challenge in terms of creating sustainable careers. And one is in that kind of emerging space where artists are trying to kind of just launch their careers. And the other one is trying to sort of, when you come out of your first success or your first kind of long form project, how do you then kind of catalyze the momentum to be able to actually spin that out into a sustainable career? So those are kind of the two stages of like an artist's progression that we sort of focus on. And so my work is to kind of design programs, design fellowships, um, work with industry partners to increase funding and opportunities for advocacy around this stuff, um, but all with the focus on like, how do we sort of work with partners and also work with the artist community to build more inclusive um, but now, uh, part of your title is outreach. <clears throat> is outreach re reaching out to artists or uh, business partners? And, uh, it's largely defined as, as artists. So largely when I talk about outreach, I talk about the work that we're doing to reach out to our artists. Um, but there is sort of a component of what we're trying to do in terms of the way that our work manifests with the film festival too. Um, there's a lot of challenges, particularly for artists with disabilities and not for the festival. And that's something that we've been deepening our work in over the last year that I've been there. Um, just recognizing like, how do you make you know, a place like Park City, Utah, that has inclement weather and historical buildings that in many cases are not ADA compliant. How do you uh, actively sort of work with venue owners and the local governments and muster up the resources to actually make the festival more accessible to audiences, um, particularly from, from community disabilities. So it manifests in a few different ways. My work is largely very artist focused, but um, I like to sort of say that we're kind of like a T-shaped unit where we go sort of deep in terms of the work that we do for artists, but we also sort of, inclusion touches a variety of different facets of the Institute and so we're kind of involved in all the audiences and maybe I, I mean, you said that your department is fairly new. Right? So Sundance is so established. I'm guessing, are you inundated with, um, with, with uh, 
offering from various artists uh, requests, or is it, is it slow, right? Uh, it's <coughs> We're in the process of kind of building out um, a program, and so there's a couple of things we'll be launching and announcing closer to our film festival in January. Um, but yeah, I mean, we try and sort of think about it as organically as possible. I mean, you know, I go to film festivals and meet a lot of artists, and I'm always at the things and just kind of like cultivating relationships in a very kind of organic way. But I think a lot of the work that we try and do is really think, how do we have impact? scale and because the way that we work because you know we're concerned with fostering inclusion um, amongst um, you know communities where like communities of color uh, inclusion amongst um, women and binary and trans artists artists with disabilities and so because we sort of go broadly in that way we're working with a variety of different communities that are not represented in the landscape or anything to be a lot of our work is really partnership dependent so like the work that we do is like Easter Seals, the work that we do with like the National Library Consortium, the work we do with like Film Independent is like so critical to us to be able to do what we do because like, you know, when you have organizations like Easter Seals that have uh, deep roots with artist communities, it makes it that much easier for us to go in and say like, how do we do something that's kind of additive? How do we help you know, organizations like you guys platform your work in a way that allows the film festival to kind of like leverage that and have greater impact? And so a lot of what we do is more kind of partnership focused, even though we are always just kind of like talking with artists and giving feedback on stuff all the time. <clears throat> You're, 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 you're with Film Independent in the LA Film what, what, What's your title? My title is <clears throat> Senior Manager of Inclusion and Discourse. Um, and the way that Film Independent is structured, I fall under the LA Film Festival branch of the company. Um, as a whole, if you're aware or not, uh, Film Independent has a Spirit Awards. We have a very strong artistic development program that we do as well as a member membership base. So we have. We have, we're very multicasting, but for the moment, I fall specific to the LA Film Festival. Um, and in that space, like Kareem as well, like I'm a relatively new addition to the company. I came on board full time in November. Um, and as we gear up towards our festival happening like, next month, um, how I, how my job is structured to work within the context of the festival is with submissions, I go out to different groups to make sure that our pool is as inclusive as possible. And then I don't have anything to do with the programming part of it, but I just make the pool as large as possible and turn it over to them to program the festival. Um, and on record, our staff are very inclusive. Like our, our um, announcement came out last week um, of our competition lineup. Um, and our, I don't know the number of art, but I do know that they are very strong. Um, and we're a very inclusive festival. And then another part of my job is panels as the discourse element. Um, so I inherited a program called Diversity Speaks that had been around maybe five, six years. Um, and I worked freelance on it last summer. Um, and based on that is how I came on board full time. Now, they like the work that I did there. Um, but diversity as a word, you know, it's kind of on its way out. Um, so I wanted to push to make the title more evergreen, more inclusive, focus on the togetherness versus, versus the otherness. So I rebranded it to We the People. Um, and so that's going to take place two days over the festival. I've been working with Nick in that space as well. Um, I'm going to do a panel specific to people with disabilities and then touch on other facets of inclusion in the industry as a whole. Um, it's going to be seven panels, I think, in the keynote. Um, so I've been very, there's a lot of research reading all the um, reports and stuff that come out, and that went into how I program. Thank you. And, and Ken Dixon, you've been casting director in some films. Um, yeah. So, yeah, so, I mean, you don't have to lift all of them, but you know, just to give us an idea, a couple of times. So, maybe I'll talk about what's coming out, and just people see it's a really, you know, with Kennedy's and Warren Ryder. Um, it's a kind of an outfest with um, Paul Rennie's TV, and Paul Rennie's idea of Paul 
Um, I've done the Bond film, I've done some of I've done a I would either do a small independent film or I do a very large award of the action film. But you're also an activist on behalf of people with disabilities. Yeah, I think very much so. Um, I've always been, um, I did a film a long time ago when I first started called Water Dance, which won a lot of awards for people with disabilities. Um, what I've done is, I look at my job as raising awareness for people with disabilities. And I created a website within breakdown services where people with disabilities could list themselves as actors with disabilities or if they wanted to list themselves without the disability, that was fine too, or both ways. So it took us about two years to do that and I was a big advocate for that and I got breakdown services to donate their services so they could get it done. And then the other thing I do, besides being on the board of the Actors Fund, I'm also coaching the Media Access Awards, which is the only award show that gives awards to people who help further the protection of people with disabilities in a good way. But, I mean, we were talking about the, um, <coughs> the low numbers in the, in the USC study. Is how would resisting this or uh, actively resisting hiring people with disabilities or is it just it doesn't occur to them? I think it's a couple of things. I think there's such a big thing now with the new diversity and every time a big organization talks about diversity they seem to forget about people with disabilities. They say women, they say Hispanic, they say, they say all these things. And I think that's the biggest problem. Because if these bigger organizations would include when they talk about disabilities, people with disabilities I mean, in terms of diversity, it would highlight it to everyone. And that's my biggest frustration, I think. And I think a lot of it comes from them not being aware to talk about it. I mean, we too, and the women think it's great, I have no problem with it, but we also need to talk about people with disabilities. I, I was talking a while back with another casting director who said she always proposes somebody uh, for, for the role of a law manager at the bank. I mean, a small role. She said, I'm not even looking for money. And I'll propose somebody who's in a wheelchair or, or somebody with Down syndrome. And they'll say, oh, no, 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 that would be distracting. To the um, but so, she, I mean, she was actually getting resistance. Unless the script actually says... You know, a loan manager in a wheelchair comes in. It doesn't occur to them. But is that well, I think the way to get around that is I think if you bring people in with disabilities and you put them on tape, because everyone's going to see them on tape, you're not meeting anyone in person, and you don't really ask about it, you just kind of do it. I think then they're just seeing without any prejudice. And I think that's the way you have to do it. If you go and ask a writer or a director, gee, can I do this? Chance you know he's going to say no because he wrote it, he has been thinking long. And that's not necessarily my job. My job is to cast what he wrote. But at the same point, I've done it many, many times. And it's worked. And the Telsey office, which I'm not part of, does it constantly. So you just have to be a little inventive and a little proactive and not really talk about it, just do it. Yeah. Um, but, you know, again, talking of people with disabilities, depiction. Because, you know, Hollywood, whenever there's a hit, they always imitate it. But I'm thinking, okay, Marley Matt was like, what, 1988 or something. I was like, why, why did this not start a flood of people saying, okay, let's really cast a person with disability in this role because look how, look how well it worked with Marley Matt. I think that's because of the time, to be honest. When she was nominated, um, I don't think people really even kind of were aware of people with disabilities. I think she was the first person to kind of be like, oh wow, she's deaf, she can act, and she can win a Nicole nomination. Um, I think it's more just getting people to be aware. And I think people just aren't aware. And I think when you make people aware, they want to try to help. I mean, that's what I found. I mean, no one's ever said to me, no, I absolutely won't do that. No, I won't look at it. I have never had that happen to me. So I think it's just a battle that a lot of people have to join in and help fight. Um, but Nick, you, you've also made the point that if somebody's writing a script, um, 
and, and writes in with a character with disability. The script doesn't have to be about disability. This could be the next door neighbor. This could be a romance um, that, that has nothing to do with this. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, to your point, you know, with people with disabilities, we don't, the storyline doesn't need to be about the disability. Um, you know, I'm three foot ten, but the, the entire storyline doesn't need to be about me not being able to read stuff in a grocery store. It could be me being in a fight with my wife because I didn't take out the trash. You know, like, these are typical things. We live a typical life. Uh, the the issue, I think, part of it is it's it's uh, you know the writers' rooms and showrunners don't have as much of uh, you know I've been doing stand up for a long time, so because of that, I know and I you know I write and I produce and do things. So certain writers and stuff they know me, so you know I, I played a role on this show alone together where I was just a yogurt guy, not a big role, but it doesn't address my height. There's no joke about it. I just play that. I think when you have a, um, a connection to people and they, they're able to see you and you're able to have that one-on-one -on -one and say, hey, you know, Kareem already knows me or, you know, and then he's writing something and, you know, or, or writing for somebody else in a wheelchair, they, it, it helps, you know, and I think that's what's beneficial about the Easter Seals Disability Film Challenge is the majority, of, we had 58 films created for this year's challenge and the majority of the films show people uh, for the first time in different positions as you know, a love interest or a bad guy or all types of different storylines and the majority of them have almost nothing to do with the disability. And so that puts people in a good position because they have a calling card where they can show themselves, play the type of role that they want to play and authentically show disability. And, you know, to, to speak of a success story that was very recent, um, you know, the Farley brothers who have been probably one of the biggest um, uh, like I guess activists in terms of actually hiring people with disabilities in large studio movies. They, they had a role for a little person woman uh, on their uh, upcoming season two of Louder Milk. And they reached out to uh, the film challenge and they said, hey, we want to see films of little people women. So I was able to show them a bunch of films. They auditioned everybody and you know, th this woman got a major recurring role, of really probably her first big break uh, to be in a ba major recurring role and a love interest thing. I can't give away too much of the storyline, but that came from her being able to have a piece of product. And so they were able as writers and producers to say, hey, it doesn't have to all be about her disability because look at what that she did there. And that was great. It was about her in a fight with another woman in a real situation or, you know, so, so I think that's what, what helps. Um, <clears throat> this, earlier this week, I was talking with a woman uh, about this panel, um, and she said, please make the point, the biggest sin is to depict uh, people with disabilities as noble and poor. Um, I thought it was an interesting point. I'm not sure that is the biggest sin, but, but I want to hear what you guys think. I think it's definitely a luxury just portraying us as people without, you know, kind of going about the, the wheelie jokes and the speed limits and all the other things that we've heard countless times. I think at first we have to, you know, acknowledge that and kind of dress the elephant in the room, but then it kind of goes on as you know, the, the time stop movement and all the other kind of things that are just, you know, getting momentum right now. Eventually we'll just see us just being us, like you have no fight with your wife or you know, other things that, you know, it doesn't have to always address our physical needs. Can I just say shout out to my wife? Sorry to use you for an example there. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no. But, you know, sometimes we can be heroic, you know, I guess. But sometimes we could be bad. I guess we'll say that. Uh, I'm actually um, in, the, in the process, just kind of my, my pet project after I really wanted to do a literature high school week. Oh. <laughs> Why not? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, I talk about that a lot, in, particularly in, in response to like the last film festival, our last film festival in January. One of the things that was like the, the thing that blew me away most, it was like the first year that we did an episodic section of the festival. Um, and there's this one series that came out of it called This Close from Shoshana Stern and Joshua Feldman. It's amazing. 
It's so amazing because it's just it's completely irreverent. It's doing exactly you know what your per, the person you were speaking of says not to do. It's like, you know, it, it doesn't it doesn't you know depict the main characters as heroic and you know struggling through the adversity of disability. It's just like it's about their lives. It's about their friendship. It's very irreverent in the way that it talks about their 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 lives and their disabilities. Um, and it's fantastic. It's an amazing series. I love it. Um, but also, now this is, um, we talk about um, in front of the camera, but also behind the camera. Um, because I, I feel like the statistics are so low, it's probably not even in USC's radar. Um, but I mean, and Caitlin, talk about um, the, the, the kind of misperceptions about uh, uh, the, the general people have about hiring someone with a disability. I think it's, um, you know, there are, you know, very much it's kind of its own struggles on its own way. I just feel like going on auditions whenever I'm going walking to a wardrobe and kind of presenting, by taking it as a script, you know, whatever visuals I think, you know, might be all in line with the director and the producers they do based on, you know, the script they have a chance to be able to talk. But I think it's still about whenever I walk in a room, I always feel like the, um, the, the luck on my side, right? It's, it, you know, so whenever I walk in a room and I look around, I, I, can try, I can kind of sense that they are nervous and that you don't feel, feel really comfortable. And it's, you know, it's been, um, and this is thing navigation for me to somehow address all the nervousness and calm them down, you know, I've been doing this for 11 years, doing it really need to do, you know, everything is good, but I think it's still, you know, like Pam said, like being the allies, being the ones who are there, 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 Again, what, what you're talking about, post-production work, I think, and especially visual effects, I think it doesn't matter. It, 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 it absolutely does not matter what kind of But when you go to a meeting, do you, do you always write it up and just say, look, in case you're, you're nervous, here's this? Or do you, do you just sometimes just... Um, I kind of feel it out. You know, sometimes you know, we are in a very similar room. I know I don't have to preach the choir, but if I know if I'm in a different room, it doesn't really matter what I say. My decision is already been made, so I don't even have to just go in and just make the best comparison I can. Yeah. But a lot of times, whenever I'm um, supervising on set, I do get a lot of like, oh, you know, I've never seen a, you know, anyone in a wheelchair. And I was like, me neither. I haven't seen one either. You know, uh, if, if I can too, I'm, I'm really excited that you're, he, she's joined as a judge for the film challenge. Uh, and, and I think really though, in a, in a lot of ways that you are a role model and a mentor, you know, your success, but you ultimately have 11 years of experience and you have the USC training, you have all these different things that put you in a position where it just makes sense to hire you either way because you're good at your job. And I think part of the issue that we as people with disabilities have with this, why aren't there more people working behind the scenes, are one, there's just a lot of people with disabilities don't have the experience, you know, yet. And I think that's why you know some of the guilds have been reaching out to us and saying, hey, we're we're open to doing you know uh, a workshop that teaches more editing skills for so that for people for the film challenge, they're able to do a lot of this on their own. And obviously, that's they're not going to be at the level of expertise as Caitlin, but it's a start, you know. And once you're able to do certain things, I mean, now we're living in a digital age with DSLR camera and you know Adobe Premiere, you can edit and have your own kind of production in a smaller scale uh, that in the 80s and 90s and early 2000s you couldn't. So I think that there will be more and more people with disabilities, you know, taking these roles, especially as the studios and, um, you know, big players want to in include people with disabilities. Well, that also raises another question. People with disabilities, I think, maybe sometimes don't apply for jobs because they, they feel like, what's the point? Um, but I think you know, again, they have to be encouraged. And, and I also think the employers 
I love it too. You, you told me that. When you come into a room, that's all they see is the needles. And, and it's like, wait, there's a lot of creativity in that. There's a lot of smart angle. I mean, aside from slapping them, I mean, <laughs> how, do, how do you get that across? I think it's just really all about um, education and awareness. How I think about it, you know, is if I, you know, if a person is born with, you know, certain limitations and they're able to go up, above and beyond that on their own, isn't that great for problem solving and just kind of putting out all the fires that post production is still you know, I'm sure they'll be great in that. There's, you know, for example, for when I travel, I have like five or six backups that no matter what thing goes wrong, like we're going to be good. That's great. <laughs> production. <laughs> People just don't really think about that. They just think like, oh, this this, is, this person probably need an extra X Y Z. Where in reality, like we're bringing so much more to the table. No. And in terms of your outreach and all that, is there a, a, a training aspect of it, or is it more guidance? You mean in terms of the way that my program runs? Yeah. It's a little bit of both. It's a little bit of both. And so. You know, what we had to do when we created this new inclusion initiative at Sundance, even though every program is sort of doing it in a lot of different ways, a lot of what we had to do was just kind of standardize that information and standardize just the way that we we're communicating with different communities. I mean, I think, I mean, you know, when I speak with a lot of artists with disabilities, I mean, one of the things that comes up, I mean, Jim Lebrecht, who's a sound designer, who's a good friend of mine, I've worked with for many years, I mean, he, he, he's the, the first one who has said, said to me that, you know, the, the, the fight for civil rights and also for media representation for people with disabilities is easily, you know, 20, maybe 30 years behind the communities. And I think, you know, when we're trying to, I see that very directly, like when I'm trying to reach to artists with disabilities. I mean, I've asked Nick and I've asked Nancy about this a bunch of times because I feel like, you know, when I find organizations that really have deep roots within specific communities, um, that's, that's really great for me because I can go in there and say, okay, who are the artists that you're working with? Who are the awesome filmmakers that are coming through the film challenge? And we can find them and support them and bring them through the programs that we have. Um, but, you know, one of the things that we found, and I was briefly mentioning to you before we started this, and, and Kate, we were there too, there was this convening at the Ford Foundation a couple of months ago where a bunch of different organizations that are all sort of invested in doing um, deeper work with um, artists with disabilities all sort of came together and said, okay, you know, here are the different constituents that are trying to push the needle on this work. Work. Here's what everyone sort of identifies as the problems. Um, and one of the central problems that came out of that, which is something that I was starting to see anecdotally just in conversation with the organizations that are doing a lot of this work, is that there isn't really sort of like one organization that is at the center of like pushing the needle on this stuff in the same way that, for example, like, you know, in the public media world, there's um, a consortium called the National Minority Consortia. And so there's an organization called Black Public Media. There's, um, there's Latino Public Broadcasting. There's the Center for Asian American Media. There's Vision Maker media, which works with the indigenous communities, um, and there's Pacific Islanders in communications. And like, even though they're in the public media system, they have, they, they sort of work in this like, they have a foot in like the public world and a foot in the commercial world, um, largely because they're very underfunded and they need to sort of seek sustainability in a lot of different ways. But, you know, even within and outside of public media, they have sort of deep roots and can say like, you know, we are the experts in really pushing the needle around representation for this specific ethnic community or collection of communities in some cases, um, and how it manifests in a lot of different ways, right? There isn't really that same kind of organization for communities of people with disabilities. I mean, and recognizing that again, that's an array of community. There's no sort of like monolithic kind of singular community there. So like, you know, that's that's largely like one of the challenges that we face as an organization that like has recognized like we want to be able to support artists from these communities better, but just being able to kind of like find artists that are from communities with disabilities is inherently challenging because it isn't centralized in that way. And so like a lot of what we do is, particularly for artists with disabilities, is very individualized because there aren't those like sort of centralized organizations. And that's changing a little bit. And I know the work that you guys are doing with the Disability Film Challenge, Easter Seals in general in terms of embracing you know, particularly the Southern California branch of embracing like your role as like being in this kind of media hub and taking on the media representation piece of it, but also like organizations like Respect Respectability that are putting together like, talent lists. So that's starting to change a little bit. That's making it a little easier for organizations like us to do more like scalable outreach. But um, it's challenging, and so largely it is thus far kind of like individualized. Where 
it's like, oh, Josh and Shashal have an awesome series or a festival this year. I want to make sure that they're able to, you know, spin off that success and build that into a sustainable career. And so, like, we're finding ways to kind of, like, work with them and bring them more into our infrastructure. And so, but they're more in kind of the mid-career space now. So, like, how do we then find artists who are just starting their careers and how do we pump them into the various programs that we have for first time filmmakers or early stage artists so that we can kind of continue to cultivate that talent. And so, you know, that's kind of a long way of answering your question, but I think it addresses just like systematically what are some of the problems that organizations like Sundance um, that are trying to have deeper engagement with communities with disabilities, but um, needing to be able to kind of have those partners that have the deeper ones. To my stores. Yeah. Yeah, and you know, I said they're better than Google. But but I think you know, I can only go to them so many times. It's true, and I, I use Jim Breck in the same way. Like he's just informed and starting to reach out to just filmmakers and artists of all kinds. Um, uh, from communities with disabilities, I'm just trying to say, hey, like, you know, who do I know? Who do you know? And just trying to informally kind of aggregate a list in that space. But it's like he's a filmmaker. He's running his own business as a sound mixer and sound designer, um, and he's now, you know, in this sort of in this sort of thrust into advocacy space. So it's like it's being taken on by like passionate individuals. But like again, like Nick is like you know a working artist. Like he's got his career. And so it's like how do you create actually systems that can do that? Because when you have like those like sort of media activists or media equity organizations that are community specific in that way, it makes it a lot easier for us to do our job because you know one of the first things that I did when I started at Sundance is just saying like okay I, we need to do two things right first we need to understand like what are our values in terms of inclusion what does that specifically mean because it can mean a lot of different things I'm sure some of you guys talk a lot about it for the thing too like, I feel like we have all the same conversation when I'm talking about you um, but so. What does that mean, right? Um, because there's a lot of different ways to define inclusion, right? Even if you're saying like, these are the collections of communities that we're saying are priority, and then saying like, these are secondary priorities, right? Because you have to be able to, like, you can't do everything. So you have to say like, what are the communities that we feel like are kind of, you know, most under threat, right? Um, where can we have impacts? And then sort of secondarily say, okay, now how do we also work intersectionally within those communities at other areas, right? So like, that's one piece. So one of the first things that we did is say like, we drafted this whole value statement, which I talked a lot about at our festival last year, which is to say, um, you know, what does inclusion mean in terms of our values? And basically it's stating that, you know, if there's any single community that's denied access to um, resources, to the means to connect with an audience, to uh, talent development and mentorship, then the entirety of the artist community's needs are not being met. And so since the core constituency of, of, of Sundance and the artist community, inclusion is kind of wired into that, right? But the first thing that we need to do is be able to say, what are the communities that are a priority to us? And so we've identified those communities of color, women, uh, LGBTQ communities, and artists with disabilities. And those are kind of the four areas of focus where we know that these are the communities that are kind of like most ignored by, by the larger media landscape. And, you know, so how do we then do that work? And so the second thing is, like, is just being able to say, you know, is just being able to sort of gather the data and report on it as well, because I think, you know, again, to Jim's point about the, the work to support communities of artists with disabilities being 20, 30 years behind a lot of other disenfranchised communities, you know, prior to when we started in Sunday, it's like we weren't even tracking artists who were applying whether or not they identified as a person with disability, right? So if you're not even tracking the information, you can't hope to actually have it. So that's something that we've started tracking, so now we're in the first year, it's so like, okay, how many people that apply to our artist lab identify as a person with a disability? So we can kind of set benchmarks and then say, okay, now moving forward, how do we now make specific commitments to say, okay, you know, in the same way that we've set benchmarks to say, 50% of anyone that comes through our labs is going to identify, needs to identify either as a woman, non-binary, or a trans. Looking also at racial and ethnicity breakdowns, 50% of the people that go through our labs also have to identify as people, right? 
there weren't tracking information around applicants who identify as a person with a disability, but now we're tracking that. And so now we can move forward, start to say, okay, now looking at realistic benchmarks, here's kind of our target every year of artists that we want to support that identify. So I think there's a lot that, but, but again, like a lot of this just came up from having informal conversations with individuals that I know that are doing the work. And in terms of saying, you know, setting those benchmarks is one thing, but then saying like, where are these artists going to come from? Being able to partner with organizations is very important. So like having those experts in the field, because I'm obviously not an expert in this space, so I rely on you know folks that are doing this work day in and day out to be able to say like, what are the needs? How do we support? How do we do something that's added? And so just being able to sort of like state overtly like these are our values and then report on like and gather the information around the way that folks identify at the beginning so that we can set benchmarks. Yeah, I'll, I'll add on to what Graham said because it, our organization is very similar. Um, so we're very much on the same space. Um, and although I fall specific to the festival, um, I have started to get into the, the mindset of the company as a, as a whole. Um, like, the first like three months of my job, like I read all the reports, I wrote a mission statement for myself, I ran it by all the different departments, the president, the executive branch, I was like, here's what I want to do. Um, and I can just feel the sense of, since I'm a new person within the organization, He's been talking a lot about awareness and how inclusion and diversity are the pretty the living words, and they they scale like they go in. People with disability weren't so much on the radar internally at Film Independence, but because I've been on board since November, it's very much everybody checks in with me, even though I'm just in festival. They know they have access to me, and I help out across the board to to help inform and create awareness within the organization. And like Graham said, like I do a lot of outreach as well with like LAD and other organizations of capability, Easter Sales, to get informed myself so that I can go back and talk intelligently when I'm in the context of the um, And it just to go back to um, where this where the push for people with disabilities stands and the awareness within Hollywood um, and the and the creative community is like I just we just had unconscious bias training in the office like a week ago, right? Um, and it created a really great dialogue um, of us, like off the record as a company, just dealing with our awareness of otherness, how we see ourselves and how others see us. Um, and just very specific to my personal social situation, like my mom was dean of um, disabled student services when I was going there, right? So when I went to work with my mom, I was just in that space. So I was socialized that way, where it's, it's nothing to me. Like, first, right? So I just think, how do we do that in a larger scale with Hollywood and like the creative community yeah. to socialize them so that there isn't the stigma, so there isn't the unconscious bias of what comes with inviting that, in, like invite people with disabilities into, on a set, like in a writer's room. Like we just need to break down um, and address that. Okay, I'm busy with that. Because you've been an activist for a long time, you know, talking about people with disabilities 20, 30 years behind, would a, a central organization, like the uh, equivalent of the NAACP, where, so if the filmmaker said, yeah, I would like to hire some people with disabilities for my crew, they would have a starting point beyond people. Is that... Is that a good goal, or is that a little unrealistic? Um, I think it's a great goal. How realistic it is is another question. But what's really interesting, about a year ago, maybe a year and a half ago, this organization of Washington came onto the Hollywood scene called Respectability. And what they have done in a year and a half is incredible. Incredible. So it shows me that if you have the right people running that type of organization, it could definitely work. Because respectability has stepped forward among a lot of organizations that were in the forefront. And at birth, 
I, I want you to see as much as possible. They have really done a tremendous amount of work in this area, and the reports are really interesting and really good. And if there was a way to organize something like this, it would be great. It would be great, I think. Because the biggest problem you have is you don't have people doing outreach from the organization, so there's not. Then you don't have a place where people can really go, especially behind the scenes. Yes, you can go to breakdown services if you're an actor, but you can't do anything if you're a writer director. Well, where are you going? The guilds do not have programs for this. The Motion Picture Academy doesn't have it. The TV Academy has a very small program, but it's not really that active, and they have a lot of trouble within their disability committee, which I've spoken to before. So I think this type of thing would be absolutely fantastic. I really do. If I could say too, well, you know, I, I want to thank you. She she was one of our first mentors uh, for the uh, Disability Film Challenge, the, literally the first year, and has mentored each year, each of the five years. So I think we were talking before about gate. A lot of this is really gatekeepers, uh, but really, it, for mid-level people career, it's awesome to get in the door and get. But in general, just mentorship is really where what leads to jobs. When people, when an actor gets to each each year in, in categories, we have mentorship meetings from Peter Farley to Pam Dixon. Who you know, having an actor get to meet with a legendary casting director and sit down, it's in her head, and it's in she's. They work together. Casting directors work together. Writers work together. Scott Silveri, you know, was a mentor. He worked. So really, I think in a lot of ways, it's getting that original meeting, whether it's for a mid-level position or more just. You know, uh, meetings just to just to start the dialogue and see that there are there is talent out there, and you know it's something that we're addressing more as uh, in terms of people behind the camera. You know, each each year, you know, I see, I'm seeing a lot of different people, not just the winners of films, uh, but but also people that have take part in the Easter Seals Display Film Challenge. Is it John Lawson who's uh, over there? You know, he he and won the first uh, Disability Film Challenge, enters every year. And he's, you know, it's taught him skills, another kind of component of it to where he's editing and, you know, now he knows how to do green screen stuff and, and he's been able to use that. So I think ultimately we're trying to uh, make our surveys uh, show us who is behind the camera with a disability so that we can really have those opportunities out there for the other guilds that have that have kind of approached us and already wanted to do uh, workshops. The, the Editor's Guild, the Cinematographer's Guild, they, all these people, they want to help. I mean, I think, you know, from CBS has mentor meetings. There's all these gatekeepers that want to, to meet with people, but ultimately, and this is something that I always say, as people with disabilities, yes, we don't have enough opportunity, but we have to also come to the table and do some work and have stuff to show. Because if it's just a meeting and you're not actually doing anything, it, there's only so much that somebody can do. Whether they love you or not, they're the best person in the world. You have to be trained as an actor. You have to be trained. You, you know, she's got 11 years of experience in USC training. If you want to do her job, you got to be as good as she is, you know, I and mean, ultimately. So, you know, I think that we just need more experience, and, and I'm honored that we've had and, and lucky and appreciative that you know, people like Pam that have been open to, to these mentor meetings, and I think it's gonna happen more and more, and it's happening you know, outside of the Easter Seals Disability Film Challenge. These studios are coming, and they wanna be, uh, come to the forefront and really help include people with disabilities. A lot of what we're talking about is, is entering the mainstream in, in, in film and TV, but I feel like the, the, the upside and the downside is technically it's, it's pretty easy to, to do a film and post it up on YouTube, but getting people to see it is something else. I mean, it's a, how much is it, because you talk about this with, with your own career, it's, it's, it's a little bit of self-marketing. Absolutely. I mean, that's the biggest component of it is you make a great product, but how do you get people to see it? You know, there's, you know, 5,000 submissions at the Holly Shorts. I'm sure there's a lot of great films that just didn't, that maybe no one's seen. So I think with the, that, that was the, so the second year of the Disability Film Challenge, we realized that we needed an awareness category. So on top of there being best film, best filmmaker, best actor, we came up with an awareness category, which is over the course of two weeks, you have to come up with 
like a campaign to get the most likes, shares, and views for your films. And this became a snowball effect. So if you watch one film, ultimately it's going to go right in through YouTube and Facebook to watch all these other films. But this gave people, because uh, it's, it's tough. It's really hard as an artist. I know for myself when I'm writing or producing or, or acting and stuff, I'm, I don't like to be like, hey, check me out in this thing or come to my stand-up show because it's annoying. <laughs> but with the awareness category, this gives something where it's like, hey, you know, this is, we could get a big mentor meeting. It comes with the Dell computer, you know, a Dell uh, computer. So there's a lot of stuff here and reasons why during a short category you can hey you know this is what we do we try to help give a toolkit so that people can get their films out there but that's a big component especially for the disability community and even outside of that I'm also really a, a proponent of we need to be sharing all disability content all articles really getting everyone out else out there and, and showing people because speechless has, has shown that there is an audience for uh, great content that features disability authentically. So I think as up and coming artists, that's the biggest component. You know, we, we need to be savvy on social media. And I think the awareness category of the film challenge really helps because it's like, hey, it's not my fault. I have to do it because it's during this two week period. But I think, you know, doing that outside of the film challenge with their own careers, whether you're a writer or a producer, you know, getting yourself out there, work leads to work. And if people don't know you're working, then generally you're not going to get that next job. Thanks, Claudio, for James. You know, as we have these four diverse shows on TV, I would love it, you know, for speechless or fresh off the boat to have the equivalent of diverse that they have on screen that they do off screen. And that's all we're all looking at. I went to see all the films this year, um, and the quality of films from the year I first started to this year, I would say 100%. I mean, they were just great. It didn't matter who made them. Um, they, I just was so impressed with what you've done here. You really have done an amazing job. And really just, I really just, You're part of that, so. No, but I'm not part of it. But um, Easter Seals coming in has been so great. The screening had the most amount of people I've ever seen at any of the screenings in all the years I've been with it. And I'm just really proud to be part of it. And both of you deserve great credit for your hard work. You really do. Um, but I also want to talk about some of the people in the industry who um, are positive role models. You mentioned Sterling Brothers. I, I also think, I honestly don't know the answer to this. I feel like all the guilds, they, they, they are doing outreach, but I don't know, if, are they making it possible for people to join the guild once they've gotten the training? I don't know about that, but one thing I would say is, I would argue that actually the answer is not in educating or socializing to your point. Um, guilds or executives or you know those forms of gatekeepers, like the, the one benefit to being 20 or 30 years behind in terms of media representation is that you can look at what didn't work for other folks. And I think that you know what we've seen and what hasn't worked for communities of color are these diversity fellowships, where like you can go through as many of these fellowships that studios offer as exist, but if there aren't showrunners and creators on the other end of the, the spectrum that are going to then hire you, then you're basically just bouncing from fellowship to fellowship. And so, really, I think the socialization that needs to happen, and this isn't unique to this community, this is, is true across a variety of other communities, is making a commitment as a decision maker in a creative space to actually build a more inclusive behind and in front of the camera cohort is really the most critical thing. And that's where when we work with organizations that are trying to push for impact um, in a more tangible way, that's where we started to see success. Where they're actually going from studio to studio, not meeting with executives, but going into the rooms with the showrunners and creators who are actually developing the content. Ryan Murphy, I want to give you an example because um, a friend of mine just went into his university program and she actually is working on like four weeks. And it's the greatest program ever. So anyone that wants to be a director or writer should really look into Ryan Murphy. She's fabulous. So I, I 
was actually, I wrote in the CBS uh, Diversity uh, Comedy Showcase. And, you know, I wrote for that for five months, wrote like literally like hundreds of sketches. Uh, but I remember them saying in, in the room, uh, the executives, uh, that look, you can't think of this like we, we're, you're gonna get a job. You're gonna hire each other. So your network is where you're gonna get jobs. So even from this, you guys, people with disabilities, I know that when you're creating a film challenge, ultimately, you know, it, it's, it's your own team. You know, the mentor meetings are amazing, but it's also continuing to collaborate with people that you find. And after this, there's a networking section uh, where, you know, you get Easter Seals Disability Film Challenge refreshments. You got a little uh, <laughs> website uh, plug there. <laughs> But uh, no, it, it's, it's, it's this kind of event where you're just able to kind of meet people that are at the same stage of, of career as you or that you might want to keep working with. That I think that's a really beneficial uh, component to, to succeeding and continue to build the ladder. I'm going to give two quick plugs. One is for people in the audience if you guys are interested in um, kind of more uh, workshops you know, for Film related roles in the entertainment industry. There is a great program called Light like, Summer Access 2.0 that you can check it out on Facebook. They'll have their LA event this fall and they go all, all across the country New York, Los Angeles, and Chicago this year and next year. So be sure to check them out as well. And one of my mentors, Terry Hartman Squire, she's been working with Getting Images and Oath to create more kind of positive images of people with disabilities and they came up with a great collection called the disability collection that I'm sure to check you check guys out or maybe you sign your next one. Yeah, it's amazing that's that's probably important. Um, well, I also wanted to um, develop mental disabilities. Um, is it, is, if somebody is on the autism spectrum and, and they're an actor, should they, should they tell you and the employer up front so they know what they're getting? Or is it like, it doesn't matter? Well, I think that's an individual's opinion for him to have uh, I'm probably not going to have anything one way or the other because if they come in and they do the audition, that's what it's about. Um, so, I don't know, I mean, one of the part of me says, no, you shouldn't, and the other part of me, well, maybe we should. But I think what makes you feel comfortable is when you're auditioning, it's your time, it's what you want to do, and I'm really just watching and reading with you. So, I think you have the right to do whatever it makes you feel comfortable because the most important thing is to do it well. I'm also curious to ask you, remember, well, all of you, uh, with a film like, I can't remember what came Phoenix, so you won't get far before, where, you, where you're having an, an actor play somebody with disabilities, and it's like, okay, I know the star system the film might not have gotten made, but on the other hand, it's like, how long are you going to use this as an excuse? Well, I think it's a couple of things. I think if you're fair, if you want to shoot people for the role, and people with disability to open it up totally. The best person should go for it. That's just how it should work. And if Joaquin Phoenix auditioned with people with disabilities and he was the best actor for the role, then he should get it. Because I don't think you should give someone a job because they have a disability. And I don't think they want a job because they have a disability. I think everyone is on grounds of let's hire the best person. What I don't think is good is if you have a role like that and you don't audition people with disabilities, then that's wrong. You have to open it up all the time. And I don't think anyone with a disability would really argue about that because everyone agrees the best person should get the job if they should have a fair opportunity. Uh, you want to open it up? Uh, what, what? I think just to, for one one thing on that, for that specific film, I also want to give a shout out to a film challenge participant that had a supporting role, Santina. Uh, she's not here, so I was, it looked like I was about to point her out, but she's not in the room. Uh, Santina, she's amazing, she was in there. So, I mean, that's one thing. You, hey, Tatiana Lee, amazing actress right here. In a film that won the awareness, talk about the awareness uh, award right here. She's been sharing the film a day, every film. She's almost, her and John Lawson are two of the most supportive people in the disability community. They're really talented. Uh, but, but speaking to that specific film, it's, you know, it, having other people with disabilities as supporting characters, the supporting characters are generally never going to be selling the movie. 
So to, to be having somebody in there, you can't use that excuse, well, we couldn't get it funded for the fourth lead. All right, I'm sorry, like, that's not, if, if it's the first person, the Joaquin Phoenix role, that's in a lot of ways, you know, I know from the producing side, it is really tough to finance a film. And I think it's, it's on us as the disability community to say, look, we have a giant market, so if you can really find um, you know, that, that main character that's awesome, and we have like this huge uh, group of people that are gonna go to the opening night because this person with a disability is in that starring role. So I think we need to step up to the plate more as, as to show our, our buying power as 20% of the population. But I think specifically what, what gets me really annoyed is when you're seeing people in supporting roles that are also not, you know, uh, being actual authentically cast. Um, speaking of what gets me annoyed, especially for visual effects, and this is just purely my own thing because, you know, for visual effects is good for all, but I would love to see a stop of, you know, kind of throwing in millions of dollars, um, and, you know, kind of putting together these you know, people without limbs or something through the through the effects, through visual effects. I would love for that to stop as my own personal thing. I think they look amazing. I don't think you can tell, but beyond that point, I think they should just go with someone that has like characteristic from the beginning. We have our inside ringer here. She's gonna start changing the VFX from inside. <laughs> Yeah, let me just open up the uh, questions from the audience. I just like to make a comment. My daughter was in, and um, the other day I got, I submitted her on After Tax Out to a USC thesis film, and she got the major role in the film, which is the first time ever, and what was most interesting, the person who was, well, I mean, maybe it wasn't a thesis time, it was from a, a class, um, the person who wrote it, directed it, produced it, was a high school student from the Bay Area taking a class at USC. So, if we can get them when they're young. <laughs> Yeah, that, that's been a big component of what we're looking to do. With We give a 50% discount code, not only to uh, alumni, which if you are alumni, make sure you use that code when we open up our submissions in January. Uh, but no, but we, we give a 50% discount code to students because we know these are the people that are going to continue to work with uh, people with disabilities for not just one film, for five films or six films. Because generally, once you build your own team, especially early on in your career, you're going to use the same people. You see these big uh, film directors now, and, and somebody, you know, the, their first film, the person before they're famous, now they're famous, and they're in each one of these films. So that collaboration, it's so important, and I, I guarantee you that you're going to probably, you know, because you're so great, you're great in the, the film challenge short, you were great in that, I'm sure, and you're going to keep working with that director. The other thing, too, was it was not for a person with a disability, but he felt she fit his, that her personality fit the character. Awesome. 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 Woo! A lot of USC clubs here. We got, uh... <laughs> I just want to um, ask about like insanity, how Gil does not offer that. I think that's what you you would said because I couldn't hear very well. But I just wanted I just want to say that say does have insanity program for diversity. Could, and could you re could you repeat the question? Sorry, because there's that. I couldn't hear very well, but I think you covered where the Gil does not have programs to cover diversity, but SAG after it does offer incentives up to a certain amount. And what frustrates me is that somebody will offer me a role, not necessarily the reading role, but 
when they um when they go um well you do realize I have a win and they're like would you would you come for extra work? I'm like <laughs> excuse me <laughs> you know I mean I'm not saying that's a bad thing doing extra work and stuff you know but like come on <laughs> Did you not read my resume? It clearly says PWD, you know? So I'm wondering, what can I do as a performer with a disability or stuff like that to, like, you know, not to be an issue? Like, we need to climb up, like, when you mentioned um, Joaquin, if we don't if we can't get a small role as a PWD, how do we get it to the name? Well, if I if I can, I mean, I think that first and foremost is creating your own work because you you put yourself in an right. undeniable position when you're able to say, hey, this is the kind of role I want to play. I'd be a great nurse, so I'm going to make a short where I'm playing a nurse because well, no one can, you know. And 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 I think you know to your point, the SAG AFTRA, they they're an amazing the SAG AFTRA Performers with Disabilities Committee and SAG AFTRA, they do a lot to try to help people. People with disabilities, they're a key, uh, you know, sponsor of the challenge. The Producers Guild, uh, Diversity Committee, uh, they have a workshop. The Writers Guild uh, does stuff. So the guilds are trying. You know, I think they're dealing with you know limited resources um, for create your own work and put yourself in a position. Try to, if you can't do it yourself, you, you know, learn some editing skills. Enter the challenge. You know, do do. Do something so you're you're able to put yourself in a position where you can play the kind of role you want to play, right. and then when you have that, you know, you may be seen by somebody that gets you in that bigger role. But it's it's tough, and I think it's tough for everybody, whether you have a disability or not. You know? Yeah. At this point, I think that's the key: is creating your own content. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. We got one. Oh, right here first, and we'll get to you. Hi, my question here. My question would be, as a, I guess as us as performers uh, with a physical disability or with a disability in general, what can we do to not be, I, I don't want to be put in a box ever like, oh this is the wheelchair user, the girl in a wheelchair, as much as I'm super proud of it and I always, I'll, hey, I, I would love that role since they are so limited, but at the same time, I don't want to just be seen as that, I want to be seen as whatever else I can be, the Latina, the, it doesn't matter that she's in a wheelchair. What can we do as somebody who's sort of just starting this journey to make sure we don't just limit ourselves or does that make sense? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, what I would say to you is that's why I break down services. We did it so you could list yourself two different ways. In other words, if you submit yourself an actor's access, if you don't want me to know anything about your disability, you can do that. If I, the only people that can search disabilities on breakdowns, actors' access, are casting directors. So if I have a role that's written for a girl or a woman in a wheelchair, I can type that in and everyone that's said that will come up. So I can call those people in for auditions. So you have the, you can do it either way. Right. So if you see a role where you're not required to be in a wheelchair and you want to submit yourself, just do it. And then if you get called in, you'll have an audition. I, I think most. I would say too, though, you know, to, to somebody that's you know three foot ten, I, I think the ultimately it's good to, to you know brand ourselves as we're disabled on the way in because you know that's what we it's uh, uh, disability is the D in diversity is what we hear, we call this today because ultimately this is the largest minority population in the country so I think it's not going to ever hurt you when when somebody says oh and they're in a wheelchair and they're great or and they're a little person so I think ultimately there's power in us owning that we are disabled and set you know and, and being like look this we are and you know this is what it is you know ultimately with casting and productions they may not like you because they don't like the color of your hair or they were looking for somebody 15 years older it might not be even about your disability but I, I feel like it's not gonna be, be you know I don't, I don't know me personally I think it's good for you to, to showcase it and by the way shout out to your 
great film, and, and you doing, she's an amazing uh, piano for songs. She's a, she's a great, talk about uh, awareness. She's like a machine on Instagram. So. Right here. Hi, uh, my name is Cheryl Beckford. I started this Google Doc, uh, well, I should say that I got sick and tired of white guys telling me I don't know any. So I started a Google Doc of women of color in the industry. Right now, we just la we launched in March, we're up to 300. Our Facebook group is down here, 1,000. And we also have uh, women of color uh, who are disabled. So uh, you can all join, uh, just see me afterwards to get you on the list. And I actually just used my own money and started sending it out to um, uh, join Variety Insights and started sending out the Google Doc and sent it out to over 2,000 people in the industry. So the other thing is to know that there are people out there who uh, are your allies. Uh, we're in other spaces, we're doing other things, we're trying to push this needle forward because I'm a very, very big believer in that whether it is Hispanics the 14% of uh, sorry, 14% of the population, blacks the 13% of the population, or the disabled that are 20% the gay community, that together we are a force. Like we can actually change the way that Hollywood views everybody. I mean, I was one of those people who grew up around people who were disabled. It's nothing to me. I've had them in my films when I was at NYU. Shout out to NYU. Because all you people from NYU are seeing. Uh, oh, and AFI, thank you very much. So, uh, but no, I did. I started very young having people because that was the idea of socialization. And so uh, it wasn't anything that was odd to me. So I challenge Hollywood to say that if, if you know, all of these mar marginalized groups, because together they're the majority, um, are, uh, as far as socialization, I have to say, take a look at the world around you, in your own family. I, I, I call BS in a lot of that. Um, because if you're 20% of the population, then that means what? About a fifth people have people, exactly, have people in their own family. So this idea of learning how or whatever, whatever. You know, whatever. I don't have time for that. I'm too old at this point. So I just wanted to say that you know you can join the list. Um, that there are allies out there who are working. Just let us know how to help because the more groups that are together, the the more the more it's not even about inclu inclusiveness or diversity. The more we can make content look like the United States and the world. In the We don't need a microphone. But uh, we all talk about the one in five or 20% of the population, but there's a new study out by Nielsen that shows that one in three households, one in three households has someone with a disability that identifies with six different types of different, different disabilities. So that's 30% or one in three uh, households have that. And the number, once it gets into it, is closer to one trillion dollars in discretionary income that can be spent by people with disabilities. And going back to being cast as someone with a disability, I, I've been in a few roles where I wasn't. And the thing to me now, after being in this advocacy thing for nearly 30 years, is that in real life, I'm a dad. In real life, I'm now a grandfather. And in real life, I'm the first double amputee to become a private pilot. I'm the first double amputee to become a scuba diving instructor. But in Hollywood, in the fake world, I cannot portray any of those people. I don't get cast as the dad. I don't get cast as the granddad. Because I don't have hands. You certainly couldn't change diapers, but I did. You certainly couldn't fly an airplane, but I do. So it, it's, hard, it's hard to break past the, the barrier. But I'm going out on a lot more auditions now, and I think things are making changes. Uh, SAG-AFTRA, there is a per Performance with Disability Committee. It's very active and do a lot of work. Uh, we've worked with the CSA, who also has uh, uh, new things going on now, uh, with uh, a big uh, national uh, open call that just happened not too long ago. So there's a lot of things going on. The Writers Guild also has a disability committee that is very active. So the guilds are supportive, and the guilds do have the committees, and the guilds are starting to move up. Um, and, and, and also with the AMPTP, we, uh, the SAG-AFTRA PWD committee has 
got it codified now that we will meet with the AMTTP at least twice a year. We're having trouble finding the dates to get it done, but it's there. It's starting to happen. It's starting to move, and I'm seeing a lot of difference from 30 years ago. And the first person with a disability to win an Oscar was Harold Russell, who was a double hand amputee in 1947. The best years of our life. And then that it took until 50 years later, or close to it, uh, when uh, Marley Mountain won. And since 1987, 50% of all Oscars have gone to an able-bodied actor playing a character with a disability. And there have been 59 Oscars given for uh, characters with a disability, and only two of them, Harold, Harold and Marley Matlin, only two have actually had a disability out of the 59. Wow. I would just Thank say, you. if you guys love the our little weird town that sometimes doesn't make sense. Uh, don't give up. You know, like, you know, it's been said before, this is kind of like what you're doing it every year. I think that's, at some point, where I was like, should I really just listen to my parents and just go to that school? <laughs> 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 right? But, you know, it does get better. I know it's, it sounds cliche, it does get better. A couple years ago, we don't have people, like, going, you know, like, people, you know, heading up the diversity thing anywhere. I've never even really heard of spot that I'm doing for some big corporation. There is never a line in there. There's never a line for disabilities. And for the last couple of years, all I can do is find this kind of community disability. A long cast, and so I'm going to be talking to you afterwards. <laughs> because I need to do it now on our own. And then talking to the there's a weird conversation to be had over the merits. I know the 60 second spots, but they matter. People are watching, and I think there is much more I just wanted to follow up um, on Amy's comment. My sister won the Comic Award, and if you've been such a massive proponent, I'm a to find the access to people that look different. I mean, I've been trying to cast an older black lady for six months. I got a ton of them. I don't have anybody. Tatiana, you're going to be in my next thing. Like, you go a way that you're raising awareness. I think it's exactly right. I think mean, this should be at every single festival because it's the only way we get access to you guys. It's, it's, we're out there, we're looking. I love that you've been doing this and, you know, you've been such an active participant in casting. It needs to be more. I, I just think it's, it's, it's talking, it's the dialogue, it's raising awareness. And so, I wish you all luck. Add one thing too, is uh, thank you so much. That's, that's so much. But ultimately, uh, a shout out to Pam to these casting directors that are doing that. Honestly, because you are, you are. She's bringing people with displays in the room. So that's ultimately, you know what? And and it's it's changing. I mean, we got contacted yesterday by or uh, two days ago by. Um, uh, what's it called, Criminal Minds, and they wanted to reach out. Hey, we want somebody with a disability. We want to see the film per, uh, challenge participant in this specific role. So, you know, do you have anybody? People want to see. So the, the, this, the cast directors and the studios want to see us more. So I think the more we keep 
you know, making films and being in festivals and being together, you know, that we're going to ultimately, just like you, you're a working producer and now you're exposed to this, you're going to bring that up to your casting people that, hey, I saw these great people with disabilities that are out here and we should be thinking about them. Oh, I just had one thing to say. Uh, just when you're thinking about disability, don't forget about the diversity because that's one thing that I get caught with because I'm a black girl in a wheelchair. So yes, usually do I have to worry about when they're looking for someone in a wheelchair, do I am worried about the white girls going to get it opposed to me? Yes. So we have to do, deal with that. So also think about that, like Tomato worrying about like her being Latina and Caitlin being, you know, Asian. And so think about those things as well. There's people that are in disability that are part of the LGBT community. There's people with disabilities that are part of the Latina and Black and Asian community. So please don't forget about that. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you so much for this opportunity. I love this project the day before and like it has opened up so many opportunities for me so thank you to the Easter Seals and to Nick and all you guys and everything that you guys do. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, okay, so, yeah. First off, I mean th this is a terrific panel. I mean thank you all. Thank you all. Hope you can um, but, uh, but also, you've been a, a, an amazing audience. Thank you. I mean, a, a really attentive and smart, and with great questions and comments. So thank you for, for this. And uh, yeah, we'll see you at the next festival. I think that's a great idea.